This war is a simple black and white thing. Either Putin is evil or NATO started it. But when did the war in Ukraine really start? And who really started it? Good day to you, you 5.1 million awakening wonders. Do you know that only 48% of the people that watch these videos are subscribing? So if you ain't subscribed yet, subscribe right now and come on this journey towards truth together where we awaken individually and collectively. The reason this channel is growing so fast is because of you. And I mean, not just because you're literally subscribing, but because of the information in the comments below. You are educating us. This is a discourse, a two-way discourse, where admittedly, I I do most of the talking. If you want to come and see me live, I'm all over the UK. You can come and see me in Scarborough and Sheffield in like a week. There's a couple of tickets left at each venue. You can come see me in Bristol, Plymouth, Glasgow, Blackpool. You will love it. Come and see me. The shows are fantastic. Now, we've been talking about Ukraine for a while because, of course, the entire world is talking about Ukraine. That doesn't mean that the rest of the news has stopped. Doesn't mean that coronavirus and the legislation around it's gone away. Doesn't mean that authoritarianism isn't on the rise in countries beyond Russia. But what we really want to understand today is how did this situation really begin? Of course, you could have what is called infinite regress. Oh, because of Stalin. Oh, because of American colonialism. Because of British imperialism. But a very important time in the escalation of this conflict was 2014. And it's that in particular we're going to talk about today, because it seems to me that when you're talking about the neo-Nazi component, American interventionism, this was a key episode in the situation we find ourselves in today. Let's have a look at it. Now, obviously, what we're offering you is an alternative to mainstream media. To them, the war in Ukraine is a simple situation. Putin is evil. And then other people counter with the escalation of NATO hostility as to the culpability being on the other side of the fence. Nearly a decade on, the 2014 Revolution of Dignity, as it's known in Ukraine, remains one of the more widely misunderstood episodes of recent history. Yet understanding it is critical to understanding the ongoing standoff over Ukraine, which can largely be traced back to this polarising event. Like today's Russia-NATO tensions more broadly at the heart of the Maiden protests was the push by some Western governments, especially in the United States, to isolate Russia by supporting the integration of peripheral parts of the former Soviet Union into European and Atlantic institutions, and Moscow's pushback against what it saw as an encroachment on its sphere of influence. Presumably, although it was much protested against, at the time of the war in Vietnam, you wouldn't be able to say, hey, this is a proxy war. It's no one's business what goes on in Vietnam. We now know and are able to understand it was a proxy war between communists from Russia, American colonialism, and that's like completely appreciated and fully understood. At the time, even though there was a massive countercultural civil rights movement that was opposed to that war because of the draft and numerous other reasons, there still would have been a mainstream narrative that was like, we absolutely have to do this in Vietnam. I like even having explained to me that there was an intention between America and Europe to create institutions in former Soviet nations because for 50 years, the Cold War had been the dominant threat to global stability. And it was a truly polarizing event. A lot of you have mentioned in the comments below about the Cuban Missile Crisis and how when Russia were willing to put missiles in Cuba, how that very nearly brought about the Third World War and are drawing comparisons between the militarization of Ukraine and other surrounding former Soviet states and that event, how it is, in essence, a hostile encroachment upon Russian sovereignty. That is one component of this complex and sophisticated geopolitical issue. A major turning point in the US-Ukraine-Russia relationship was the 2014 violent and unconstitutional ouster of President Viktor Yanukovych. Elected in 2010, a vote heavily split between Eastern and Western Ukraine. In 2014, Yanukovych was taking his second crack at the Ukrainian presidency. Once in power, Yanukovych's rule was again marred by widespread corruption, authoritarianism and, for some, an uncomfortable friendliness to Moscow, which had made no secret of its backing him in the previous election. The fact that Ukraine was starkly divided between a more Europe-friendly Western centre and a more pro-Russia East, the same lines that largely determined the election, only added to the complication. 
Ukraine relied on cheap gas from Russia, but a plurality of the country, not crucially an absolute majority, still wanted European integration. You can see that this is already complex. There was a leader in place that many believed to be corrupt. There are territorial divisions. There are alliances between former regimes, the former Soviet regime in the form of Russia, a desire for European integration. So this war, this conflict is occurring amid a degree of complexity. It's already, just reading this, not as simple as, that Putin, he's a bastard. He might be a bastard. None of this, of course, is an attempt to negate the transgressions made by Russia under Putin. That seems to be a foregone and understood aspect of this conflict. It's simply to point out that due to the nature of geopolitics, due to the nature of globalization, due to the nature of centralization, you're going to be dealing with a lot of interconnected issues. It's not going to be, oh no, there's some baddies. What are we going to do? And I think that whenever you find yourself supporting the intentions of a particular group in a way that lacks nuance, you are beholden to investigate your own position. Like, why is it that I believe that Putin's just evil and there's no discussion to be had? Stand with Ukraine. Of course, stand with Ukraine. Of course, don't bomb people. Of course, don't kill people. Those are some issues we can immediately agree on. War and violence are wrong and bad. But if we're truly going to find an amenable solution, we're going to have to understand the nature of the problem. His political career was caught in the same bind. With his party formally allied to Vladimir Putin's own United Russia party, his pro-Russia base wanted to see closer relations with its neighbour. But the oligarchs, who were the real reason he'd gotten anywhere near the presidency, were financially entangled with the West. And they feared competition to their grip on the country from across the Russian border. All the while, two geopolitical powers in the form of Washington and Moscow hoped to use these cleavages, grow up, to draw the country into their respective orbits. Yeah, of course, because the centralised powers of America and Russia do need to simplify the narrative because they have a solution and an agenda in mind. The only way you could actually get anywhere with this is to let go of an outcome, right? You'd have to go, all we want is peace and for people not to be harmed and for ordinary people to have as much power in their own lives as possible. As soon as you go, I'd like it if the outcome was financially beneficial to the United States of America, or I'd like it if we were able to control these resources, or it would be good for us politically to control that territory. As long as that's in the mix, as long as the serpent of self-will is intermingled with your requirement for particular outcomes, you are never going to achieve a peaceful outcome. You will achieve a malign and self-interested one. The backdrop to the 2014 coup and annexation cannot be understood without looking at the US strategy to open Ukrainian markets to foreign investors and give control of its economy to giant multinational corporations. What? America? Trying to open up new markets. Hi, how dare you? How could you even, what evidence? When is there previous history of America trying to open up markets to global conglomerates? Oh yeah, always, all the time, with every single war there's ever been. A key tool for this has been the International Monetary Fund, which leverages aid loans to push governments to adopt policies friendly to foreign investors. These groups like IMF, they all pose as like these neutral agencies, but they've all got funding, they've all got an agenda, they're all working in collusion with corporate interests. We will lend you some money, go on, as long as you keep talking, do exactly what we tell you. The IMF is funded by and represents Western financial capital and governments and has been at the forefront of efforts to reshape economies around the world for decades. Reshape economies. That's take over sovereign nations. We just like to reshape your economy. Reshape economies around the world for decades, often with disastrous results. The civil war in Yemen and the coup in Bolivia both followed a rejection of IMF terms. Oh, what a coincidence. Are you slowly awakening to the realities of geopolitics and the way that it is underwritten by required outcomes of corporate interest? In Ukraine, the IMF had long planned to implement a series of economic reforms to make the country more attractive to investors. Not the people who live there, investors. In 2013, after early steps to integrate with the West, Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych turned against these changes and ended trade integration talks with the European Union. 
Months before his overthrow, he restarted economic negotiations with Russia in a major snub to the Western economic sphere. By then, the nationalist protests were heating up that would go on to topple his government. OK, so this dude was starting to snub Western and European interests in favour of Russian interests. Whether you believe that's right or wrong, that's you know up for you to determine and decide while picking through this complex information. But what it starts to make me think is the kind of sanctimony and piety of Western support of the situation in Ukraine has to be queried a little bit. <gasps> Stand with Ukraine! Stand with them! Because there's a little wrinkle in this where people were trying to set Ukraine up so that foreign investment opportunities would be presented. They weren't like, oh God, what can we do for Ukrainian people? If Ukrainian people are helped, that's a byproduct of their financial interests. His ouster came after months of protests led in part by far-right extremists. Weeks before his ouster, an unknown party leaked a phone call between US officials discussing who should and shouldn't be part of the new government and finding ways to seal the deal. After the ouster, a politician the officials designated as the guy even became prime minister. OK, so there was this insurrection that occurred, whether you agree with it or not, because you maybe think that old Yanukovych weren't the world's greatest guy, and the chances are that he probably bloody well wasn't. The fact was there was Western intervention in the government of Ukraine. As political turmoil engulfed the country in the lead up to 2014, the US was fueling anti-government sentiment through mechanisms like USAID and National Endowment for Democracy, NED, just as they had done in 2004. In December 2013, Victoria Newland, Assistant Secretary of the State for European Affairs and longtime regime change advocate, said that the US government had spent $5 billion promoting democracy in Ukraine since 1991. $5 billion promoting democracy. Whose democracy? For who? Like, it's like, oh God, we've just got to help Ukrainian people. Come on, let's promote democracy. Do you get anything out of this? Oh God, I suppose down the line there could be these political advantages and these economic advantages, but as long as democracy is okay. If you care about democracy so much, do it in your own bloody country. The NED is a key organisation in the network of American soft power that pours $170 million a year into organisations dedicated to defending or installing US friendly regimes. So this is a thing that goes on. You can't simply just absorb the crap that flows out of mainstream corporate media. You can't just watch that and go, oh no, Putin's bad, oh no. There's a whole set of agencies dedicated to destabilizing unfriendly regimes and installing regimes that are friendly to American business interests. One thing that I've thought for a while is British colonization was all done very upfront. Dun, 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 dun. We're here on behalf of the Queen to nick your country. And then we realized you can't do that. People don't like it. We have to give all the countries back to the people we've nicked them off. So America was like, what if we never actually overtly steal a country? We just replace all of their structures, profit from their minerals and business interests, and nobody needs to know what's happening. Happening. Now the true nations are the corporate nations. Now the true interests and powers are the corporate powers and the governments are merely the facilitators of their interests. Discuss. Comments below. The Washington Post's David Ignatius once wrote that the organisation functions by doing in public what the CIA used to do in private. Wow. Destabilising governments and installing friendly regimes. The NED targets governments who oppose US military or economic policy stirring up anti-government opposition. While this is still not conclusive about why the war in Ukraine is happening, it is important information. That's not nothing. All of that's not, oh, that's all irrelevant. It's just Putin's evil. He's the new Hitler, is what he is. That is an attempt to borrow an existing narrative to flatten out, iron out nuance and prevent you saying, God, I don't know that we really understand what's happening here. The solution probably involves a wide range of things like NATO not encroaching on that territory, like America ain't going to intervene in the democratic process of sovereign nations, which America aren't able to do because all of their relationships with corporations, the very corporations that fund the two political parties in America, are contingent on pledges of that nature being made. Oh, we can predict the profits will go up this much because we're going to have access to these resources. We can predict your profits are going to go up this much because there's going to be a war and we're going to be selling it. You know, this is 
where reality takes place. There are two economies. There are two realities. There's the reality that we are fed in order to keep us compliant and docile. Then there's the reality that underscores that, the actual reality, the reality that they don't trust us with, the reality that we're not informed about, the reality that you have to take responsibility both on an inward trajectory and an outward trajectory to understand. You have to make yourself familiar with that because you're not going to receive that information elsewhere. And it's absolutely vital. The US involvement was part of a campaign aimed at exploiting the divisions in Ukrainian society to push the country into the US sphere of influence, pulling it out of the Russian sphere. So no doubt there was complexity in Ukraine prior to that. But these fissures were exploited. Why? Not to help Ukrainian people in order to create economic opportunity. In the aftermath of the overthrow, Russia illegally annexed Crimea from Ukraine. So that was bad. In part to secure a major naval base from the new Ukrainian government. The New York Times and Washington Post both omitted the role the US played in these events. Why? Why would you? Because it creates complexity. In US media, this critical moment in history is completely cleansed of US influence, erasing a critical step on the road to the current war. That's key, huh? The 2014 revolution in Ukraine was an enormously complicated affair, yet for most Western observers, many of its basic, well-documented facts have been either excised to push a simplistic black and white narrative or cast as misinformation and propaganda, like the crucial role of the far right in the revolution. In truth, the Maiden Revolution remains a messy event that isn't easy to categorise, but is far from what Western audiences have been led to believe. It's a story of liberal pro-Western protesters driven by legitimate grievances, but largely drawn from only one half of a polarised country, entering a temporary marriage of convenience with the far right to carry out an insurrection against a corrupt authoritarian president. That's a complicated plot, right? OK, so you've got a polarised nation, you've got progressive pro-Western protesters, but they're making a marriage of convenience with far-right Nazis. That's so complicated. The sort of ideas that start to appear in my head when I hear that level of complexity is, why would you centralise such a diverse group of interests? Who benefits from having one centralised government? Why are we not having libertarian, anarcho-syndicalist systems of government where communities are made as small as possible, not as large as possible, as small as can possibly be effective? What is the advantage of scaling? Who benefits from power being centralised? Those are the kind of questions I would be asking. The tragedy is that it served to largely empower literal neo-Nazis. If there's one thing we can agree on, is there? That we don't want Nazis? Can we agree on that? No matter where you are on the political scale? While enacting only the goals of the Western powers that opportunistically lent their support, among which was the geopolitical equivalent of a predatory payday loan. So they offer them financial solutions based on compliance. And one could argue that the current war is in part a result of the conditions that were set out here. It's a story tragically common in post-Cold War Europe of a country maimed and torn apart when its political and social divisions were used and wrenched further apart in the tussle of great power rivalry. And the Western failure to understand it has led us to a point where Washington continues to recklessly involve itself in a place full of shadowy motives, shifting allegiances, and where little is what it seems on the surface. None of this is to say that Putin's invasion is justified, but calling it unprovoked distracts attention from the US's own contribution to this disastrous outcome. The US ignored warnings from both Russia and US officials that a major conflagration could erupt if the US continued its path, and it shouldn't be surprising that one eventually did. Now, as the world once again inches towards the brink of nuclear omnicide, it's more important than ever for Western audiences to understand and challenge their own government's role in dragging us all to this point. What I take from this is that we're dealing with a situation of almost unimaginable complexity with numerous players, with shifting ideals, and no one is free from guilt in the creation of this conflagration. As the writer of this brilliant piece suggests, all of us should think about our own personal autonomy and perhaps a little more tangentially, the type of governments we have and the type of interests that our governments truly represent. The war in Ukraine is a tragedy for the people that are dealing with the reality of conflict, the reality of being displaced, the reality of losing people they love. But to simplify the narrative does them a greater disservice to say simply that Putin is an evil expansionist. 
even though he may be, while neglecting to include vital information that the political interests and economic interests of our own governments and agencies that are set up primarily to support financial and corporate interests led us in this direction, that there are various ways that this crisis could have been averted if true democracy were allowed to flourish. In our own communities and our own lives, let us insist upon transparency. Let us insist upon democracy. And now we have a situation such as the one in Ukraine. We have to be open and clear about it and resist the attempt to marshal and shepherd us into simplistic thinking piety, sanctimony and further foolishness because the people of Ukraine deserve better and the only way the world will significantly change is if we are able to change our consciousness and our understanding of such complex situations. But that's just what I think. What do you think? You are educating me. We are in a discourse here. We are in a conversation. Let me know in the comments below what you think we've neglected to clarify. If we've made a misstep, if you like the sources that we're using, let us know below. Let me know how this makes you feel. Does this make you feel disheartened and less empowered? Or does it show you that there is a way for you to personally awake and engage in this stuff? If you enjoyed this video, have a look at this one or this one and come and see me live on tour. Glasgow, Bristol, Blackpool. I'm all over the country. It's a wonderful experience. We deal with this stuff directly and I hope correctly. Sign up to the mailing list too so I can continue to communicate with you and most importantly of all, please stay free.